Oh, good morning. Good morning. I appreciate those who are up at the front not crushing this or being very gentle. Uh, my wife's like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> now, as you can see, this is a really nice basket. Now, what would you think if I told you, if I could prove it, that this is actually one of the 12 baskets that picked up the fish and loaves that Jesus multiplied so many thousand years ago. Now, uh, you got to use your imagination. Now, some of you are like, yeah, right, you can't. That's impossible. That's not going to happen. Use your imagination. Pretend this is one of those 12 baskets. What would you do if somehow I could prove, you know, Jesus appeared right now in a, in a form and said, this is it. Okay, what would you do? Would you want to take your picture with it? Would you want to look for some crumbs and maybe there's still something left in there? <laughs> And I'll eat it. I'll eat it. Right? Would you want to, you know, would you want to take it home and display it? Bring it to a museum so others could display it? Do you think people would want to buy it from me? How much do you think it would be worth? I mean, you know, the, just for archaeological uh, um, uh, evidence alone, I mean, you know, this would be quite valuable. Would people travel, other believers, would they travel here? If we could display this, would people travel here to see it and to get their picture with it and to just touch it or reach their hand inside? So, I mean, that's just a basket. Uh, it had some fish and loaves in it. But what would that mean? How much would you treasure it? Now, there are things that people have treasured. I'm going to put this off the side. Okay. There are things like this that people have treasured for many years. They've said that we found the nails that were the nails on the cross from Jesus, or pieces of wood from the cross, or the cloth that Jesus was wrapped in. Um, there's been people who have had a quest for the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus drank from during the Last Supper. What if we found some sandals that Jesus wore? Let's assume that we found a pair of sandals and we could say those were the sandals of Jesus. What would you do to just try them on and walk just a foot in the sandals that Jesus wore? There are things like this, these, these artifacts or relics that people have tr they've chased after and they've given great deals of money to go and to see and assume that these things are real. And I'm not going to get into whether what we have and whether it's real or not, but what I want you to think about is how much do we treasure the physical? Jesus talks about what we should treasure. He talks about treasuring the kingdom. And I want you to look at this parable found in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus talks about the kingdom. And he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and he reburied it. And then... In his joy, he goes out and sells everything he has and buys that field. You know, you're in a field, maybe he's having a picnic, and he puts his hand down and feels something hard, and he dig it up, and whoa, put that back. Don't tell anyone, because someone else will get that treasure. Go out, sell everything you have to buy that field so you can have what you just found. Or like a great merchant who is searching for pearls, and he finds one that is priceless, I mean, this is a merchant who, he's very familiar with pearls. He knows he's seen all kinds of pearls, but he's never seen anything like this. And so he goes, he sells everything he has so that he uh, can buy this pearl. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net that is thrown out into the sea and it collects every kind of fish. And when it's full, they drag it ashore. They sat down and they gathered the good fish into containers, but they threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous. I want you to remember that. This is something, there's a connection here between the evil and the righteous, the good and the worthless. And they'll throw them into the blazing fire. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said, have you understood these things? And they answered him, yes. And if I ask that question, if Jesus were here this morning and asked me and you that question, have you understood these things? 
Do we really understand it? We might say yes, but Jesus might say, no, I don't know that you do. Therefore, he said to them, every teacher of the law, every scribe, who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven, is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom treasures old and new. A scribe who understood the old covenant, understands the Old Testament, and they become a disciple, and they are enlightened to the understanding the full meaning of the Messiah coming. And, what, and now they've got old treasures and new that they can come out and share. Jesus talks about treasure and he connects it with the kingdom. And the reason why I bring this up is because are we familiar with the kingdom? Are we familiar with treasure? A lot of us, our treasures are here on earth. If you look, you just have to look at your life and look at where your investments are, look at where your time goes, look what you own and what you could not part with. What would make you so sad to lose? Jesus says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. You know, that the idea that, you know, what, what do we understand as treasure? Do you know when it comes to the kingdom, Jesus talked about the kingdom a lot. Here's all the top things Jesus talked about. I got this from an infographic book and I liked it. So the top five, the kingdom of God, the Father, faith, money, and Satan. And of all these things that Jesus talked about, he talks about the kingdom far more than any of those other topics. The kingdom of God is what Jesus talked about over and over and over. Even when he rose from the dead in Acts chapter 1, he appeared to them over 40 days and talked about the kingdom. Are we familiar with the treasure and the kingdom? In Jesus' time, Jesus talked about the kingdom as being near. From then on, Jesus began to preach. This is when he begins his ministry. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Some of you standing here will not die until they see the kingdom come in power. And when you think about the kingdom, we're like, what? The kingdom? The kingdom? You know, Jesus talks about the kingdom as, you know, we pray thy kingdom come. And, and yet, did we miss it? What is all this talk about the kingdom? In Daniel, Daniel interprets this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And this dream is of these, these nations, Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And he is the nation, the statue of gold. And then after him comes another nation, the, Perds, uh, the Persians and the Medes. And... and you know, then another who will be divided, and that will be bronze. You know, there's gold, silver, bronze, and then clay and iron mixed, and a lot of people believe that's Rome. But after this will come a kingdom that will, will be chiseled off this rock and come, and it will be established, and it will never fail, and it will destroy. All these others will not stand up to this other kingdom. And that was thought to have come around the time of the, of the Romans. Jesus talks about giving the keys of the kingdom to Peter. And here you see that Jesus says in Matthew 16, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And also he said to Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And you see there's a talk about the church and talk about the kingdom in the same discussion. And of course... In Acts chapter 1, as Jesus rose from the dead, the kingdom hadn't yet come. And his disciples, they knew all Jesus did was talk about the kingdom. And now it's time for Jesus to go into heaven. And they say, Lord, is this the time? Is, is the kingdom going to be restored now? At this time. Jesus says, it's not for you to know times and dates or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. And then he uses this little word, but, listen carefully, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, the kingdom was a great treasure for God. The kingdom was very important, and if we're trying to understand all this talk about the kingdom, you have to go back to the Old Testament. 
Here is God. He brings his people out of slavery and he comes to this mountain. And he establishes this contract with his people. And here they are at the mountain in Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus chapter 19, Moses goes up the mountain. And this is what God says to Moses. Moses goes up and the Lord called him from the mountain. And he said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, which you are to tell people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I have done in Egypt and how I carried you out on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, that's what you need to do. You sign the contract. I will do this for you if you do this. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, and you will be, out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. You will be my possession. You will be special. I like how in the CSB, you will be my own possession. Out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. God owns everything. The whole universe. Out of everything in all creation, he has this model for his people. If you are holy as I am holy, you are made in my image, you will be my treasure. You will be my children. You will be my family. After all, we're made in his image. He loves us so much, he's willing to give his only son. That's how special people are to God. And he's got this model that the Israelites can be that model, that beautiful relationship. But there's a problem. They couldn't, they couldn't keep up with their bargain. Oh yeah, we'll do that, we'll do that. We'll sign here, done. And they could not keep up with what they signed, so to speak. And so, Jeremiah talks about this. So there's their, if you will carefully listen and keep my covenant, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. He's referring to the one we just read. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And so what he says going back here. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be special. My kingdom of priests and my holy nation. They can't keep their side. They cannot be holy. So guess what? God decides I'm going to have to do it for them. I'm going to make them holy if they want to be holy. They still got to choose. And so this is the story of scripture. So Jesus comes. He sends his only son as a sacrifice. In order to help us do our part. And Jesus takes the cup which we just remembered around the table. This is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. You know what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 8? Therefore, there now is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because through Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The new covenant versus the old. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, people couldn't keep their side. God did it by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order to be a sin offering. God helped us fulfill our side of the contract. But we have to accept that. We have to be willing to say thank you. And guess what that blood did? That blood brings us into the kingdom. You see, in Revelation, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, he made us a kingdom and priests to God, to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. He has made us into a kingdom. He has made us into a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, what's interesting is that 
In Acts chapter 2, by the way, we're starting our Bible class Sunday mornings in Acts starting next week. So you'll be able to dive into this deeper and we can look through this uh, with a lot more time. It's hard to do in just 20 minutes. In Acts 2, after Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, you will be clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city. You'll be my witnesses. They stay there and the Holy Spirit falls. Falls on these apostles, these Galileans. And Peter begins to preach the first sermon in which he says, repent and be baptized, and you will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. He opens the door, the keys to the kingdom, and the church is established. The church, on this rock, I will build my church. The church is established in Acts 2. Before the church, the kingdom is near. The kingdom's at hand. The kingdom is coming. Some of you will not taste death before the kingdom comes. After Pentecost, there is more to inherit but the kingdom is never talked about as coming. You will inherit more. Paul says, you know, he, God will rescue me from every danger, bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. There's more to come. But the seed was planted already. The growth is already happening. And back in that parable in Matthew chapter 13, do you know Jesus tells another parable of the weeds and the tares? Uh, uh, the seed, sorry, the seed and the weeds. And in Matthew 13, I didn't put it up here, but Jesus is telling a story and he says the evil one, there's a farmer and he goes and he plants and the evil one comes in at night and he plants weeds in the field. And should we, Lord, should we pull up all the weeds? No, because you might pull up the good seed. Just wait till the end, till the harvest. And then we'll pull it up and burn all the weeds. And when they come and said, Lord, can you explain that to us? Jesus says in 1337 of Matthew, the one who sows is the son of man. The field's the world. The, and the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. See, the seeds have been planted. The kingdom has been established. And this is what we read of in other parts of scripture. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. The kingdom is about those who have been cleansed, those who have been purified, those who are holy, able to be back in God's family, his children. And this is open to all people, but to those who accept it, those are, those are the ones who God is so happy. He wants all people to be saved, but the ones who accept it have been cleansed and are able to be safe with Jesus. And he sends them out to go and spread this message to hunt for others because they are loved by God. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, he has made us a kingdom. Priests, able to serve, able to be a part of that, of that family. And the Hebrew writer says, since we are receiving a kingdom, we have accepted Jesus, we've accepted that contract for those who have repented, been baptized, and who have committed their lives as disciples. I will follow, I believe, I will go now. And make other disciples. You have entered into the kingdom. Which is present. But there is more to come. Because at the end. When time is over. The angels will come and pull up those weeds. And do the separation. But in a sense. We already know that we are those seeds. We have been cleansed. We have been purified. We have the Holy Spirit. We are there now. We are already saved. And so we know with assurance that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a treasured people for his own possession. Going back to the mountain in Exodus. This is what God wants, and through Jesus, this is what God's going to get. But not everyone has come to the Lord. People are treasured by God. All people. God wants them to be his treasured possession. People were made in his image. People are precious. And they've been chosen so that he would send his son. He so loved all people that he would send his only son to redeem them. And God wants all of them to be redeemed, to be saved. And these are all, there's scriptures for each of these. And when we come, we are his children and his family. We are his bride. The bride of Christ, the church. 
coming into the church, you come into the kingdom. The kingdom, God's holy people, God's treasured possession. David was known as a man after God's own heart. God loves us so much. You know what Paul says? He did not even spare his only son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not give us all things? God loves us so much. He was willing to go to the extremes for us. If you are a person after God's heart, then where should your treasure be? Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And what's the second greatest command? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to treasure what God treasures, if you love your father so much and you're like, God, I know how much you love people. And what are you willing to sacrifice to go into the world and to be a treasure hunter for God, to bring him treasure? Lord, look what I found, some lost sinners. Because you were lost and someone risked their time, their comfort, their life to go and sacrifice to teach you about Jesus. And so what does this have to do with Corinthians? We're in the book of Corinthians. You're like, oh, what does it have to do with Corinthians? I say all this to say when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and you're trying to figure out what Paul's talking about, Paul is talking about how much he loves people because they are treasured by God. And he says, though I'm free, I'm not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave for others. Why? So that by every possible means, I might save some. He knows he can't save the world. It's not our job to save the world. It's Jesus' job. We go and save as many as we can. We bring them to Christ. It's impossible to bring the whole world, one person to do that. That's why God designed the church. But is it on our hearts to go, to become uncomfortable? To give up our freedoms. Do we hurt when we look at our lost neighbors? Or do we get angry at them and say, you know what, you deserve what's coming your way. Or do you hurt, are you in pain when you see the evils people are doing and you realize that Satan is at work too to, to hurt God and bring people away from him? Do you spend time with people? Have patience? Do you recognize that you were once lost, but someone found you? Are you willing to give up your rights for others? You know what Paul says in the 10th chapter? Why is my freedom judged by someone else? He's even worried about his appearance. He thinks, you know what? Why should I worry about what someone else thinks? Back then, if you, if you ate some meat that was sacrificed to one of the gods, some people were like, that's wrong. You, you're, you're partaking of, of uh, worship of that god. And Paul's like, we know there's no other gods. That's ridiculous. But Paul says, if someone's not, doesn't quite understand that yet, if you're eating and someone's like, you can't do that, be mindful of where they're at. Paul says, why should my freedom and my conscience be judged? Paul could have easily said, grow up, you're ridiculous. He didn't say that. He said, why? If I give thanks for this food, why am I judged by someone as some judgy new Christian that doesn't understand Paul says, I'll tell you why I'm concerned about them. Whether you eat or drink, we could say whatever you wear. You could say, well, it's not my fault someone's going to look at me wrong for the clothing I'm wearing or what I'm driving or where I live. That's none of my business. Paul says, whatever you do, you do it all for God's glory. You remember his treasured people that are lost. You remember how much he was willing to give to go find them. What are you willing to give to bring someone to Christ. It's not just about giving a little time, giving a little money. This is about giving our comforts. Oh, I would really like that, but this neighbor is going to have a problem. They might think, you know, you can't, you can't please everyone. So Paul says, I try to please everyone in everything. You can't. And he recognizes that, and you need to recognize that. But at least we need to have the heart that's after God's treasure. I don't seek my own benefit, but the benefit of many, so they may be saved. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can we say that? And that's what we work towards as disciples, to be his ambassadors. Follow my example as I follow Christ. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we should be able to say to our children. That's what we'll be able to say to one another, is follow our example as you make new disciples. What do I do? Follow my example as I follow Jesus. 
It's not easy. It's not comfortable. But when you recognize the treasure that you have, the treasure that the kingdom is and its value, then that should help us to understand what that calls for in our lives as a changed life. I'm willing to take up my cross. How many people were willing to walk away from everything when they understood the value of the kingdom? So the kingdom is here and is to come. And the kingdom is of true value to us, but most importantly to the Father. There is a, a sapphire that was found a number of years ago in the States. The story says that there was a, a rock collector and he was out and he found this big sapphire. He didn't really realize the value at the time. And he thought to himself, you know what, if I have to, I, I, I'd like to, you know, it's, it's worth a lot of money. If, if I have to sell it for 500 bucks just to make ends meet, I'll, I'll do that. He didn't quite know the value, but then he didn't really need to sell it. He held on to it for a number of years, put it under his bed or in his closet, probably between the two of them. And then when he got back to it, he brought it to get it appraised. And you know its value at the time of appraisal was $2.7 million. The Star of David, some people referred to it as the greatest, the, at the time, of the largest sapphires that were, was found. He had that sitting in his closet. He had that sitting under his bed. He did not realize the treasure he had. Jesus calls us into discipleship, into the kingdom, into the church, which to the world looks terrible, looks bad. It is a beautiful design. It is a powerful design. We are filled with God's Holy Spirit, and he empowers us to recognize the treasure that we've been given, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. You have eternal life. You don't have to worry. You will live forever. You are a seed that's sprouting up in a world right now where there are weeds among us trying to choke us out and drown us out. And God's called us, though, to go and reproduce, to go and germinate the, 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 the field, reproduce fruit, make disciples so that others might turn from being a weed to turn into that seed themselves so that they can also see the treasure they are in God's eyes. For God so loved the world, he did not spare his one and only son. What are we willing to not spare to go and be treasure hunters for God? And that's what you are. You're a treasure hunter. That's first and foremost what we should be as disciple makers. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn. This world is not my home. I